Well, welcome everyone to the first OWL Hour for the College of Education and Human Development. Uh, we're happy you're joining us and being a part of the Homecoming Week festivities. And uh, hopefully this will become more of a regular routine for us on presentations of material of interest to our alumni and faculty, staff, and students. With that in mind, uh, certainly let us know at alumni.ed at temple.edu if there are topics that you would like to hear about, or if, of course, you're willing to present as one of our alumna is today. Uh, we would love to have you join in the process and in sharing information within the industry for others to have. So with that, uh, we'll let you know that sort of tonight's format is the first half an hour or so will be a presentation by Dr. Slaughter Van Tryon. And then we will go to a Q&A session that will be open for everyone. During the presentation today, which will be recorded, so please note that fact, and we'll be putting it up on our alumni website afterwards, that uh, you may use the chat room area. We will check in on that periodically if there are any questions that are relating to the slides. We may present those, but they may not be addressed until the end as well. But there definitely will be time at the end of the presentation for everyone to have Q&A and interaction. Uh, so if there are topics or areas that uh, weren't quite covered or items that you wanted to get more detail on, uh, we will certainly have time for that. And uh, as a reminder, please mute yourself during the presentation portion until we get to Q&A for opening up so we don't have background noise. And uh, with that, I'll introduce our guest presenter, which is uh, Class of 91 alum, Patricia Slochter Van Tryon. Dr. Slaughter Van Tryon is currently associate professor at uh, East Carolina University, and she's in the Mathematics, Science, and Instructional Technology Education program. She has taught there for 13 years, and I say there, uh, and the fact that she's been 100% online for graduate classes, so has a lot of experience in this area, as well as international experience at the University of Oldenburg, where she taught in the Department of Educational Sciences as well. So, we're excited to hear more about the design and developing uh, delivering of successful uh, online learning programs. And with that, I will turn it over to Patricia Slaughter Van Tryon. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you this evening, my friends, fellow alumni at, uh, at Temple University. And uh, yes, I am a professor at uh, East Carolina University. So I am not a public speaker, professional public speaker. And the good news is in online learning, you don't have to be either. Uh, it just takes a little time and uh, certainly a lot of energy, but it's not, it's not insurmountable to be able to teach online, do it well, and actually enjoy it while you're doing it. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit with you uh, about uh, how I, um, actually prepare teachers to begin to teach online. But there's uh, a lot there for if you are already teaching quite a long time online, I'm certainly hoping that some of the uh, strategies that I talk about and, and the framework will, will be of help to, to everyone. So it's kind of a, kind of a broad uh, landscape right now. Um, and I'm trying to take about a 10 hour talk into about a half an hour. So please feel free to ask questions, um, as Ed had said, ask questions anytime, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to follow those in the chat room. So uh, today's uh, talk is about strategies and you know, what do we do online? How do we know we're delivering uh, the, the best potential for a successful online course? And there's a lot that goes into planning for and having an, a successful online learning course. And I've been doing it for quite a long time. My entire dissertation was in uh, you know, how to teach online and then beginning to teach at East Carolina University. I have never taught a face-to-face -face class, so I only have this experience to share. But there's a, a lot that goes, that goes into the planning. And that's one of the differences between what's happening right now and with the current COVID pandemic is that many teachers in all realms of education are being asked to emergency remote teach. And that's very different than planning and designing for uh, online delivery as an instructional design um, uh, approach. And it's being done, it's being done as well as it possibly can. And I'm, as I work with uh, folks in that realm also, it doesn't have to be perfect just has to be safe and 
and open so that students are able to approach for help and be able to know where their instructors are, where their materials are, and even if it's disjointed in some way, as much of the remote online teaching is, there is still a way to kind of cull it in, into uh, the beginning of, of a designed course, a, a managed design course. And I look at that in four kind of avenues. Um, there, there is an administrative and financial avenue, a technical and deli you know, delivery avenue. How are you going to actually you know, present your course or courses or your entire degree program? And then there's the content design itself, the, the raw content and to keep it being mindful of standards and, and accreditation, scalability. And tonight I'm going to talk probably more about the online uh, learning environment parameters. So um, consistent engagement, uh, dictating pace, comprehensive technology support. And these are all aspects of learner support that really need to be examined and uh, decided prior to teaching. Although, as I said, with remote learning, we really haven't had quite that opportunity. We haven't had the opportunity to uh, figure out you know, how we're going to pace out a course. I just know all of a sudden I need to teach one online and I've never done it before. So we've been pretty much in survival mode and these strategies can help even work through the survival mode because um, uh, in, in this unprecedented time of change and stress and managing everything that's happening is, is far beyond our content right now. The space is different and it's going to probably remain different for quite a long time and the stimuli are different. Uh, we have teachers and professors, um, those that are trying to teach online are doing so with children at home, with their own work at home. Uh, some are working with more than one environment teaching. And so this, the stimuli is, is far greater and we have to begin to have new schema for how to address all of the changes that are taking place in how we teach on, online, but also that learning space and how that's changing how we're teaching online. So I was mentioning earlier before you guys came on that um, I left a little note outside my, my door to remind my, my family member, my husband, that I'm giving a talk this evening because right behind me is the pathway to the front door. But uh, as just a little uh, tip and reminder, I don't write any longer that I'm having a Zoom meeting or I'm in a conference or anything of that nature. I simply have a little sign that's already pre-printed that says, I'm recording. Because believe me, no one wants to be recorded. So my husband goes nowhere near the front door when he sees the sign, I'm recording. So just, just a little tip for, for being able to be alone while you're online. Uh, let everyone around you know that, that you're being recorded and, and that will hopefully give you a, a little more space for which to, to work. So um, with administration and financial, someone has to pay for the course. Someone has to present the course and be able to collect payment from those who are taking the course if there's a charge or if it's a free course, be able to manage the enrollments. That's usually handled by the, the institution unless you're doing this on, online yourself, which is happening constantly as well. Just take a look at YouTube for, for an example. So those things, um, it'll be the, the deciding factor of, of the institution as to how many resources are going to be uh, given to that particular aspect of the, of the model. And then the technical delivery, deciding what you're going to use. Are you going to use Blackboard or Canvas? I've used them both. Are you going to use Moodle? No platform at all, as has happened much with the uh, remote learning. Um, how will you handle communications? And who is going to be the help desk? And I probably should put help desk at every single one of these uh, um, stages because the help desk is, is, is key. If, if students are unable to connect, faculty is unable to get help, administrators have no idea what's going on, a lot less uh, chance of success when you don't have the one basic thing that everyone needs, and that is a good solid help desk. So again, we're going to um, spend probably more of our time in the engagement and uh, online learning environment parameters this evening. So I look, at comprehensive learner support 
and keeping learners safe as really the kind of basic structure for, for how to manage what's happening in your, in your online learning environment. And from my own research, and I can send that along later if someone might be interested, um, I've determined that frequent interactions, dictating course pace, and uh, comprehensive technological support are the three factors that really underpin uh, learner support. Learner support being key because <laughs> the learners are the reason why you're there, and the learners are, in most cases, the university level or in um, uh, community college level, even at the high school level, learners have much invested in, uh, whether it's financial or wanting to go uh, further on to college or simply um, being uh, a present and good citizen, they need to be well taken care of. And this environment now, unfortunately, is wide open for uh, threats and wide open for things that are unsafe in, in their environment. So safety in keeping them protected from someone stealing their identity to finding them and harassing them at home, but also safe in that they know where they can go for help, they know what you're doing in the classroom and, and why, and they understand that there are certain parameters for themselves when they're online. So um, when you're looking at uh, facilitating uh, frequent interactions, um, it's important for those interactions to allow each other to observe each other. So right now I have all of your video feeds uh, on the right hand side of my screen so that I could see interaction. Some of you have your video up, it's fantastic. Some have a photo, but either way, I kind of know who I am engaging with. And that's kind of a, a, a baseline for how you want to begin to communicate. Being able to share audio, even if it were just audio alone and no video and no photos, there is a, a, a large a collection of research about learners just being able to hear their instructor's voice and how commanding that is and how supportive that is just that they're able to spend time with the instructor in that way. And when you add another level, video or when you add interactive video or a way to share, not always possible in every single course every single time and doesn't need to be, but when you're able to add, when you're able to add those facets, it helps to create those missing social cues that we so count on in teaching and learning. Online, they are possible. It's sometimes uh, I find when, my, when I'm teaching how to create audio for, for uh, learning to present in online learning courses, I have graduate students and professors that will record themselves 65 times because they just didn't like the way it sounded. And, and, and that's, it's okay that a car went by or a dog was barking or that it's just not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be all the bells and whistles. So I always try to give my students something to begin with and then something to end with. So if I'm going to give them a video and I'm just gonna demonstrate a short video that I made very inexpensively, looks great, but very inexpensive. Um, I think it, many times we engage at the beginning of a course, we begin, engage at the start or the startup, and then it wanes toward the end of, uh, of a semester or of a course or of a module. And frequent interactions need to take place the entire 15 weeks, whether it's a 15 week course, a 10 week course, eight, Whatever the duration of the course, just as much as you put into it up front, that needs to be put into it at the end of the course as well. So I've created a video. This is just one of my general introductions for, for my students. And I'll tell you how I created the video. Just a couple, couple, it's rather short. I won't let it play the entire amount. Hello, everyone. I'm your professor, Dr. Slachter Van Tryon. I would like to welcome you to the course. Are you able to hear? A little bit about how the course will progress. The course is offered 100% online here in the Blackboard Learning Management System. I would like for you to first take a look at your syllabus and then go to the What to Do First link in Blackboard and watch the screencasts that will help you along with how to navigate the course. We will always have a place to ask questions discussion board should you have any questions at all as we continue the course. Along with ordering your textbook, which I trust that you already have, I'd like to make sure that you have access to a copy of the uh, APA manual and the publication manual will be really. So this is very specific to my course. Um, 
a course that they're learning in instructional design and development. And I, and I stopped myself at a very inopportune moment there. Um, it, I have created this with a free background that I received from uh, a free online service. And I'm just sitting actually at my uh, coffee table in my own family room. And the only thing that costs something from, from what I've done is my time. And I bought a piece of glass to put on top of my coffee table. And the glass allows you to blend the video. And that was $33. So for $33, I was able to create this with free uh, video software, video editing software. I had to, of course, have a video camera, um, but you can also use your phone. I use my phone a lot for creating video that can go into my, into my classroom, and I use a little video camera. But actual production, uh, if, I, if I borrowed a video camera from my school or used my phone, it's still yet even, even less expensive. Um, but it's just with a, 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 a green sheet behind my head and, and I'm actually sitting on my knees, but you might not be able to, to tell that. So um, incorporating video interactions yourself and your students in as much as possible, it's not expensive and it just takes a short amount of time really to make anything at all that you can just use, and this is a, a minute and a half, that you can use to interact with your students to welcome them. They would like to see you and while you're presenting, so if I have a, a PowerPoint after this to present to my students, they don't need to see you the entire time, but just little clips will raise their ability to, to detect your presence there. And that's the key to frequent interactions is them feeling like they are a part of something. So um, using video, text-based sharing, audio, anything that, that can give them a glimpse of why you are there and that you are there and then asking them to do the same. So back to who's paying for the platform and, and, and uh, who's supporting the resources for the course, you need a place to put those videos. I use YouTube. I'm in a university situation and that's possible. Anyone that's here in a K-12 situation, you're probably going to need a secure server if you're asking your um, students to create or your parents to create uh, to create video. So back to the, um, uh, the institution for who is supporting financially then it becomes more expensive if you like to produce uh, something that you have to really secure so that it's safe for students. And then dictating pace in the course. The courses need to have a firm schedule and that has to be decided up front as well. Whether you're teaching um, you know, a semester of K-12 or a semester of a higher institution, higher institution of higher education, you need to be able to decide ahead of time what the schedule for the course is. And then you have to decide, are you a learning repository course or a document repository course rather, where everything is placed online and at the end of the semester, students submit their work and you grade it and it's finished. Or are you an interactive course where um, every module has uh, individual due dates and at the end of the semester is the final culminating activity that you've chosen for the course. And all of our courses in our university and almost all of the institutions that I work with choose to have a, a paced course because the literature supports that that is the most productive for students, that they actually have paced out work where they have frequent and comprehensive feedback. And the feedback can be given by voice to text, by screencasting, or any number of um, uh, recording, again, recording uh, software that is of no charge. So I have a um, pace reminders uh, that I put into, into my course. These get embedded directly into a learning management system. They give you this bulky software, gives you an embed code. So I'm going to go out of our, uh, our presentation because it doesn't embed well with um, uh, PowerPoint. So I'll just step out and come right back in. Um, but it will embed well into your learning management system. And they are just really short, simple, um, sorry, sound like, really short, simple clips to keep you involved. And it's not even your video. So you can make these in your pajamas. Hello, everyone. Dr. Slachter Van Tryon here with a short bokeh for you this time. Just to say happy fall break and to thank you so much for how hard you've been working. 
I hope that you will take a good break this weekend. I know sometimes that's easier said than done. Uh, I certainly don't expect you to be working this weekend, but if you should need anything at all, please don't hesitate to send me a note or post for me, and uh, I'd be happy to help. Um, Boki is a pretty interesting and easy to use technology that you can incorporate into your own classrooms, should you like to. If you want to give it a try, you can just go to www.boki.com and sign up for a free account. Uh, not all the features are available, such as what I have here in my Voki when you use the free account, but you can get pretty far along with it and create your own Voki to share with your own students uh, in your classes. And uh, it's a great way to engage students. You can give feedback with it. Um, you can have your students communicate with each other with it and make comments on each other's work with it. So it's a really great, uh, small and easy to use technology that you can incorporate anytime should you like to. Well, again, happy fall break, and I look forward to seeing you online next week. So it's something e easy to use, yet, let me go back to the other, something easy to use, yet doesn't take a lot of time, but has a huge impact on giving feedback and having your learner feel that you are present with them. It takes about, really, as long as the video is, it takes, literally 20 to 30 seconds to create and save and post. So it's, I'm not sure if anyone's using that type of software and this isn't the only one, I'm just kind of trying to show, I have no investment in any of the uh, technologies that I'm showing you this evening, but these are ways to increase the learner support such that you are enhancing that, that online learning environment so that the students feel welcome and they can make them and send them to you you can require, I, say, I require a Vokey on Thursday, I need to have your journals submitted. So I'll have uh, 30 Vokeys come and they'll all post their Vokey URLs to a shared Google Doc. So they're all in one place. They can look at each other's and then I can look at them as well. And the time spent, the student's time spent in making the recording is uh, supportive to the other students in the class because then they can hear each other's uh, journal the ones that they want to share, um, and there are two, um, when they hear each other's journals, then they're interacting with each other as well. So again, feeling like they're in, in the same space with each other. And um, technology support, again, finding out from your institution who is supplying the technology support. If you start up an online class and a student cannot connect or doesn't have the software or doesn't know how to use their, their computer uh, security, uh, firewall, something like that, it is very difficult for them to attend and then they will be frustrated and then have a different problem. Then they feel like they haven't really achieved what they had uh, paid for or what they've set out to because they are disconnected in some way. So being able to practice having them in a safe environment and being able to know where they can go and having that set up ahead of time, you really have to be the safety net under the technology high wire when it comes to online learning environments. And I'm going to turn off my, my uh, background for a moment and, and show you something that I think is rather important about the learning environment itself, looking into someone else's space. So I'm going to turn off my background, show you that I'm in an actual room in my actual house. <laughs> and what I have my students do, and my, I teach a lot of teachers, so what I have my teachers do, this is something I wouldn't normally do in, in a, a presentation, I'm going to turn my back to you. And then I'm gonna ask, in a moment, I'm gonna ask all of you to do the same, whether you have your video on or not, it's okay. So I'm gonna turn my back, I'm gonna do the about face, and I ask my students to do this, and I'll talk louder so you can hear me. I ask them to say, if you were sitting and looking in my room, is there anything that identifies who I am, where I live, what other persons might be in my home, like a baby carriage or um, a photo? Even if you can see my clock over there, I have a little clock over there. Even that lets someone know what time zone I'm in. And it does not take much for a predator to figure out what you're doing by simply looking at everything that you're able to see in your room where you are teaching. So please turn around and take a look in your room and see if there's anything in your room right now 
that would identify where you are, <laughs> who you are, or who else is living in your home. And if there's anything, a diploma, pictures of your children, picture of your grandchildren, um, those things in some way, and you can, you can put a background up, but if there's a technological glitch and your background doesn't work at that moment, then you're really, your room is exposed. And we have, uh, we're working on um, new guidelines actually for online learners to be sure that they're not presenting literally in their beds with their pajamas on because those things can become permanent. Someone can capture a, a, a video, a screenshot, um, uh, or an, make an animation out of anything going on on the screen. And letting your students know that it's permanent is a really key task in creating a safe learner space. For kids in particular, if you're teaching teachers or teaching children, um, teaching teachers to teach children, that learning space needs to be pretty much empty. So I've taken everything off the walls in this room, mostly for this part of the demonstration. And um, I don't have anything identifying of, of me, so I don't mind not having a background. You might not have that ability in, in your learning space, or you might not have the opportunity to, to always have your screen up. So it's really something to consider having your your learners do the about face and figure out what, what is there that might identify you. And then later when we go to questions, I'll, I'll ask if anyone has something there that can identify who you are, where you are, or who else lives in your home. So again, the technology support, showing students what, what technologies are out there and what they can do with them to communicate. I've been using a lot of something uh, called Doodly, and I will share that with you. So I've created this animation for you this evening. Because you don't always have to communicate with your own voice and your own video. If you're not comfortable with it, there are tools out there that let you still communicate and be interactive, but not using your own voice and your own video. So um, taking into to account the time needed to build up to being able to create some of the technolo technology resources for your students take, does take time. I can't say that everything that I'm teaching you this evening will save you time. But in, 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 as you continue to work through them, they will certainly help you to enhance your learning environment such that it becomes more a regular part of the time you do spend so that students are constantly interacting with you and the course and the course content. So I create um, doodly anim animations such as these for quick reminders, for um, uh, upcoming um, test questions, quiz information, um, uh, also having them take part in creating some type of, of animation that doesn't include their audio and video so that they can see that it's not every single time does it have to be something where you're actually using, using your own voice. Children love, young children love to create and when um, authoring and managing and creating um, educational spaces that are safe for little kids. So something like this does not have any opportunity at all of a picture having some kind of an address or something in the background or a video. Um, and again, their kids are a lot more comfortable using their own voices than, than uh, adults are. And again, as I said, I'm, I'm not a, a professional speaker, but we don't have to be professional speakers. We just have to be sincere and spending this kind of time to create the, the learning environment will help to support you having successful learning outcomes later. So I like to try to stay in these kind of three realms of learner support as, as that one um, uh, section of, of the framework for thinking about how, how we design and develop online courses. I have some other um, 
uh, technologies there, creates us more, um, and then screencasting. I like to use Screencastify because it's free, but everything that's here um, is either low cost or free of charge. And I mean, low cost is a little bit relative, but um, not in the thousands of dollars. I, I do have presentation, presentations that I make for um, institutions that are able to afford Adobe Creative Cloud and, and all the Adobe stock photos and things like that, which are wonderful to, to work with, but very expensive. And Adobe Premiere Pro and the, the video editing software, yes, you can get up into the thousands and many hours in, in creating products. But um, everything that's here in, the, in my presentation this evening is low cost or no cost to an educator. So I think um, taking time to work with some of the products and implementing them into your classroom, as well as working to keep that, in, that learning environment safe will not break the budget. It might go over the amount of time that you are, are able to spend right now, but if you just ease into it a little, little by little and remember to make these things happen from the start of your class until the end of your class, whether that's eight weeks, two hours, 15 weeks as a normal um, academic uh, semester, I think um, there will be a, ben a benefit overall as you continue to teach. You don't have to implement everything at once. You can implement one audio file once. You can implement one screencast once but everything that you're doing to engage your learners is going to keep them involved, keep them on task, and give a better opportunity for successful learning outcomes for them. And I have to say, those of you that are in academia and you are evaluated with student opinion of instruction surveys, if you begin to work in this, in this realm of comprehensive learner support, you will see your uh, scores on your final um, evaluation forms increase. I have not worked with anyone that has done this that has not seen that happen. And that's the feedback that I've been receiving as, as you know, as a, um, a presenter and doing professional development is that they must like it because they're writing about it. They're writing about how I'm putting these things in or I'm taking the time to do this or I'm telling them and, and I'm human too. I make mistakes. I, I laugh in a video and then I'll show them, here's the one I made before the one that you have and like the bloopers. So um, it, it will make a difference to you in, in the evaluations, but more importantly, they're writing in those evaluations because they're writing about their learning and their learning needs, and you're meeting them in this way. So, I'm gonna go back further. So, um, it, I don't know if there's any, I've been talking along, but I don't know if there, if there have been any questions <laughs> in the, uh, not as of yet. If this, I'm sorry? Not as of yet. Not as of yet. Okay, good. Well, I am pretty much at the end of what I wanted to share. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I had, you know, given you an opportunity to ask if you had something uh, that you'd like to ask at that moment. Um, I study immediacy strategies and immediacy strategies facilitate communication, uh, promote the feeling of shared, uh, shared accomplishment and enhance the development of group structure. And immediacy is a way to um, recreate or re-envision the ability to feel another person's presence when you are involved in mediated communication like we are now. We have the benefit of you can see me and I can see most of you and I can tell if you're engaged or if you have questions, you know, I have those cues, but many times we are not sitting the entire course having a video feed. So we want to be able to try to put back into the online learning environment those missing social cues that we depend on for teaching and learning. So being able to create the episodic perception of immediacy, immediacy as we, as we normally know it, being able to create the episodic perception of immediacy is beneficial to learning. And if anyone is, is interested in that further, I have a, a, a scale, a measure, to measure students' uh, feelings of immediacy that I designed, developed, and, is, and it's published. Um, it's being used quite a lot, but you can just ask, put the survey out to your students and ask them to respond, letting, them know, letting you know how much they felt like they knew what was going on as far as the interaction in the classroom. 
and the, the um, uh, uh, instrument doesn't measure at all what the instructor is doing. It only measures the student's perception in what's going on in the class. It doesn't say, oh, my instructor gave five uh, strategies for this, or my instructor answered my email in 24 hours. It's not a, it's not a, a questionnaire of that type. It just, it's just a questionnaire that asks, I know who the leader of the group was, or, or I had enough information to figure out who knew the most about technology in the classroom, those types of questions. Even if you don't use that, but using some way to measure what you're doing, what you're, what you're uh, engaging in as far as your strategies for development and for design and development online will be a huge benefit also to um, assessing how successful your courses are just in the design, let alone, you know, evaluating the, the curriculum content. So that's something for future reading should, should you like to. So let's talk online. <laughs> I, I, um, I think I went a little over what I said I was going to talk and I only had a few slides, but um, I want to make sure that I, that I answer questions and I would like to just talk with you if we can Unmute if you, ha if you have questions or anything you'd like to share about your specific, this is the time, your specific learning environment. What are you doing? What's not working? How can I help? Don't be shy. <laughs> so, so Patricia, I'll start off. I guess. Hi, hello I'm there. Fine. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I like your haircut. I'm, I'm oh, not sure how, how new it it's is. It's actually all pinned up on the top of my head. <laughs> It's not actually cut. <laughs> well, I still like it. Well, thank you. It's good to see so, you. Good to thank see you. Thank you for attending my presentation. Oh, it's a pleasure. I learned a lot. So, oh, so we're right now in the midst of, of trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to support our students. And we've gotten into discussions with, with faculty uh, regarding asynchronous versus synchronous uh, modes of delivery. And um, I'm wondering whether we kind of gotten ourselves in a bit of a bind uh, inadvertently by sort of juxtaposing one against the other as opposed to thinking about them together. And could you could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And we've had very extensive uh, discussions about this at ECU. And I'll tell you what we've what we've decided. Then I'll go through a little bit of the process. So uh, we've decided that for the and I teach in a 100% graduate online, online uh, program. So for, for our program and for the, the segment of our program that is undergraduate, we've decided that we would not have any required synchronous courses, or required synchronous times in the courses. So our, our online course, truly online, we are not gonna ask them to meet on Tuesday and Thursday from five to seven for the synchronous portion of the course. We decide not to not to make that a requirement and we made that decision for our our graduate students who need to work at two o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning or have two jobs or can't make tuesday but now it's you've missed three classes now you're going to earn the b because you know that that would be the plan if you know if you're going to have those courses with selected uh, time slots for um being there synchronously then there has to be a consequence if no one shows up right so that's a fine line to follow and, 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 and difficult for a lot of uh, uh, students because they simply work then or they're studying then or it's just, it just never works out to be the right time for them. Even though face-to-face, -face, they have a schedule and they, and they show up for their schedule. Online, again, with the competing stimuli, being at a, at a place at a computer where it's quiet, where my 16 roommates are not running back and forth the beverage hollering you know, so it's very difficult to to make that a, a requirement and make that a successful requirement however we have options for synchronous in our own courses and we are very good about um, asking our students who could be all over I have, I have one in Germany right now one of my North Carolina teachers has moved to Germany and she's still taking taking my course and you know, she has a very different time slot that she can meet. So we try to be very mindful of that. And we don't make it really frequent, but we put these opportunities to interact at, at a, a, a variety of, of times. A couple of times a semester, it has been phenomenal. It has been so well structured and so well received because it wasn't Tuesday, Thursday, where I have no place to work and I can't do it and I can't, you know, and they'll do it from their phone. 
I, I mean, I, I, I've done it, I don't know if you've done it as well, but from your phone, you can get into Teams and have a Teams meeting on your phone. Does anyone use um, Microsoft Teams? So you can use, use those tools on your phone. So I like the idea of synchronous communication in an online course. I don't see it as the most productive to do it as a requirement for the online course. So now tell me, <laughs> what have you got with some of the struggle? Have you seen some of the, uh, also it's the counter of both, of both uh, opportunities? Rick? Yeah, I, um, I mean, our big struggle is that, our, and again, this is, not, this is not to attribute blame or anything that, you know, we're all creatures of habit. So as a faculty member, if I teach Tuesday five to seven, then, you know, if I'm going to online, I want to continue to teach five to seven. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that you wouldn't have a set time to teach is just sort of anathema to the way that we think about traditional teaching. So right. it's just our mindset has to change. That's one. Our, our, definitely. Our you mindset know. really has to change. Yeah. Then the other thing for us that's being difficult is sort of grappling with the equity issues. Now, this is probably a bigger uh, concern at the K through 12 level, but we know that families in Philadelphia, for example, don't all have access to the internet, to, the, right. to Wi-Fi. Right. So then when you have a synchronous class, you're basically excluding a lot of students. Then right. when you factor in issues of family responsibilities or work responsibilities, then that even complicates things even more. Yeah. So when we first went online, we kind of asked everyone, unless they were really skilled, um, had a lot of experience doing online teaching, whether they would think about asynchronous formats, at least to be in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Help sure. us. But I feel like a lot of our faculty are not comfortable with that because they don't feel like they're getting enough interaction with our students, mm -hmm. right? Live interaction. So we're trying to think of a hybrid approach. And, you know, that's where we are right now. And, and that's kind of what we're doing. The hybrid approach is kind of what we're doing. There's, there isn't a requirement for it, but I, my students, they show up. They, they want to show up when it's, when it's geared in that way. And, and you get so much from it. It's usually uh, beginning, middle, and end of, of the semester. And th there's, good, there's good interaction and, and good value in it. And, and students appreciate that they, you know, that they can have a kind of a mixed work schedule in, in the evening or that they are babysitting now their two younger uh, siblings during the day and, and can't you know, sit, on, sit on line. It's just a different world right now. And the blended approach to this or the kind of approach that, that I mean, and we really spent countless hours working on this and, and surveying and, and trying to understand how how it makes the most sense right now and maybe this model will change and maybe it will change for you as well but um and there you know i'm sure there's some accountability but creating um uh um resources a short video or an audio um and not just recording your lecture and putting it out and then not changing them again in 15 years they need, you know, they need to be built continually and having a faculty do that while there's, you know, if, if you're giving time for them to, to build or resources, we've been given very generous resources for our building and to, just to start up. And I think that's also very helpful, you know, time, time, <laughs> time when everyone has a, an opportunity to, to, uh, to take time for, the, for the, the technology that's available right now. Patricia, we had uh, an item in the chat that came in and said, uh, do you hold those meetings individually or in a group? In a group. Uh, it, however, my one student <laughs> that I meet with at, at, at a very late hour <laughs> is, um, it, it's, I am meeting with her one-on-one -on -one right now, but she um, is going to change her schedule a little bit because she, she asked, could she come to, to one of the other groups at one of the other times? So but normally, yes, it's with a group. So I have a group that is able to meet uh, early in the morning. Most of them want to meet in the evening. Um, when you're an online uh, professor, you, you set up your parameters, how you want them to communicate with you and how you're going to respond to email and, and how long, 24, our rule is 24 hours. Every email gets a response to students within 24 hours. But you decide that up front, let them know, and then, and then stay with that. And I, I think if, they're, if they know what to expect and they know when they're going to hear from you um, and when you're going to have these, these sessions, um, understanding that when you teach online, it's not really nine to five anymore. It's not really five to seven on Tuesday and Thursday anymore. It, it's kind of continuous. And that's a big hurdle, I think, for a lot of faculty to, to, uh, to overcome. 
and I have a lot of faculty that I sit with that have been professors way longer than me. And when we sit in a group and I talk about professional development, I think I might have mentioned this to you before, um, I, they, they will not ask questions and really say they're fine, they understand. But then when I'm alone with them and I work one-on-one -on -one with them, they'll ask all the questions and they'll tell me, I have no idea what this is, but they're not willing to do that in front of their colleagues. So if you're able to get some professional development also in small groups or or one-on-one, um, -on -one, um, it's, it's, you'd be amazed at the difference in, in the development. As a quick follow-up to that question, because sure. that yeah. was my question and thank you for answering that. Would you say that you do them about once a month, the group meetings? And is it the whole entire class or are you setting up like subsets of the class for those group meetings? The, the entire class gets to meet, but they are in sub-meetings per the times that they sign up for. So I might have three and 10, or I might have e even numbers, but, and they can move across groups because, I, because those, and it's about every three weeks, not every month, it's about every three weeks. And then I'll do it alone with them if they're really lost or have, a, have a, something that, as I'm teaching um, web page development, for example, right now, I'm teaching them how to you know, um, code. And sometimes they get really lost. And um, so I'll do sometimes some individual ones but they are, but the entire group, um, the entire class gets to meet, but in, broken up into um, small segments. And then they can hop over to the other ones if they would like. And depending on what the content is of the meeting, the first one's usually not recorded. The second one I record because I'm actually talking about, you know, the current assignment or the current module. Um, and then I'll record them and then they can look at them later. Um, I tell you the hits on the recorded ones are not as much as I thought there would be though. That they'll st and you can, you can watch um, how many times the, the video was viewed and not, a, not as much, not as much as I, I had thought. So, yeah. Thanks, we have, uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Renee, did that answer? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure, thank you. sure, sure. We have, a, we have a couple questions that are relating to uh, K to 12. And Fran also had uh, a question that she wanted to run by. And the, so I'll let her do that first and then I'll get to the other. All right, can you hear me properly, doctor? I certainly can, yes. Now, when I talk at this pace, I believe students can understand me, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, I would believe so. But if I talk like this and I'm going too fast, the da 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 and I pick up this, pick up that, did you understand what I said? Yes, I talk like this, I talk like that, I pick up this, I pick up that. Well, <laughs> that's you, doctor, that's listening. Yes. But for children, they have a hard time um, hearing what I say because of mm -hmm. the accent. Mm -hmm. I'm from New Jersey, mm -hmm. but I'm living in Florida. Whole oh. different pace. Mm -hmm. That's what I am learning. Pace is different here. Yes. Totally. Yes. All right. So my second uh, technique. Engaging, engaging. I, 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 I wrote down the, the doodly and the vokey I'm going to learn because animation is hot. That's hot. It is. Now, how about this? If I was to hold this and just wanted them to show uh, a word, how to spell a word, because I'm talking grades three to six. Yes. So. What are engaging techniques? If I hold this up and then we use a marker to write it, correct? Mm -hmm. That's one technique. If I'm in the back here, can you hear me? Yes. On a one to 10 scale, how does it sound now? Is it legible? Can you hear? Because I'm not shouting, I'm just talking. Yes, I hear you very well. I'm, I will admit though, I have some very sophisticated equipment that I, that I work with. So, um, because some of my students have very, very soft voices when they're making their recordings. So I, I have really a surround sound that, that I'm able to hear. So it might be good if some of the other uh, participants note if they could hear you. So maybe just a, a wave or a raise of the hand or were you able to hear, were you able to hear when she moved, when Fran moved to the back of the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cause that's a technique that you just demonstrated to me. 
with a group of third graders. Can everybody hear? Yes. And, and to each other. Exactly. And that's, yes. yeah, really, really important. And also important for the sharing. And yes. when, when the music was on at the beginning of the presentation, every time I started an online session, I will put music on and I will ask everyone to raise a hand. Do you hear the music? That's the, the first way to know if, if their audio is, is not functioning. So if, if they can't hear when you start the presentation, big problem. So I always have them come in five, sometimes 10 minutes early and, and let them hear uh, something um, to, to know, rather than me saying, can you hear me? Joe, do you hear me? David, you know, whoever. So I just play music and then they all check in that they can hear. And I think you move, something that you're doing, moving around. I move around a lot when I'm teaching. So when I give one of my, and I think, uh, I wish you were not there, Renee. Um, when I'm uh, actually doing the presentation uh, for my students, I'll move around. So I, I'm pretty sure they can hear me because I get, I mic up. But I know they can hear you if you move around. So if you want, if you want to move around and show something or point to something or, or um, be more, um, uh, we do it in classroom, it's, it's um, physical proximity. But you can do that online too, just like you've done. So, and what I would like to ask you too, sure. I'm putting the earplugs in right now. Yes. And I, to see, I just want to hear your voice. Sure. And, and my earplugs are in right now. Okay. Oh, I can hear your voice loud and clear with you. You probably can hear me much better with your head headset on. And I always have my students put a headset on. It helps with reverberation also. Thank you, because you know what? It's a totally different volume, totally. Yeah, exactly. Earplugs, earplugs are a plus. Right. And it's helpful also if there are other, like if, you, if your students live in a dorm and they have five or six roommates, there may be something private going on on that computer that you really don't want the roommates to hear. And also the roommates, you really don't want them recorded doing what they're doing. So that's why I always say put the record sign out there. Um, you really don't want them uh, being part of a recording that you're, you're making if, if you are uh, you know, the um, undergraduate. Thank graduate. you. Sure. Thank you. Oh, I'm really happy to help, Fran. Thank you. All right. The, the other question that came out of the K-12 to was, uh, what can teachers tell parents in setting expectations for their child to have a positive experience? And then I think uh, Deborah has a couple questions. So for, for K-12, I'm sorry, the, so the question is, what do we tell parents about what's happening so that they have a positive experience? I'm not, not yeah, sure. How can you tell parents uh, about the setting and helping them set expectations or methodologies for their child to make it a positive experience? Yeah, I think that parents, in, we do a um, uh, needs assessment with, with our, um, our parents, of, of the, the groups I'm working with, the parent group becomes a whole separate course um, as far as uh, their, their children. And we, we conduct a, a needs analysis with them because what we're finding is they're, to, to help them feel successful, the parents are so frustrated with this that they really don't know what's going on or why. So we've started, started with a needs assessment and then started holding small talks for the parents just to include them in, this is why we're designing in this way. This is why we're recording in this way. And this is how we're keeping your child safe. And the parents have told us, I have three K-12 children and my teacher uh, for my young son wants him on at nine and my other son on at, at nine and my daughter on at 9.30 and I have one computer and I don't know who gets, who gets to be online with their, with their teacher. So the communication, I think, you need to be able to set up how this is going to work as far as their schedule their time, their availability, as, as we know, we also in, in North Carolina are sending out mobile labs with, with um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi access because we also have many children that don't even have access. So involving the parents one-on-one uh, -on -one or in a group to share with them that you have a plan, this is why you're doing what you're doing, and telling them it's okay if, if, if you're, if, you're not there every single moment, that it's not perfect. It's okay that they are, that if the child becomes stressed to let them slow down, maybe not take part as 
I know this sounds very scary but every time I say it, but not take part as intensely as, as they are until they, as they are at that current moment, until they get more used to the environment. And they also need to be able to move. So a, a lot of um, K-12 instructors are having their students sit at a desk and, and talk, but unless you taught that, <laughs> If you taught that way that, that you had a third grader that you didn't let move for 45 minutes, that's, that's also difficult. So said, ha, speaking with the parents, letting them know that you have a plan and that you're trying to be as accommodating as possible and it's okay if it's not perfect. I think that's a great point for them. We have a, a couple more questions. I don't know if Deborah wants to uh, ask it directly. She can do so. Um, hi. Hi. So I'm I'm a second grade student teacher. Okay. So I have questions for both the, your both levels, I guess. Like for your college courses, do you always um, record lessons online and have students learn that way, or do you just have them read the book, do videos, and uh, you know do discussion boards? So it's always a combination because the multiple ways of delivering the information it's going to be able to capture more of their learning needs. So I have some lectures, I have some written um, uh, um, uh, structured modules that have very small amount of video and, and more uh, reading and interaction, interaction on, online. I, I'm very involved in, in their discussion boards, but I don't have every single, uh, um, lecture for the entire any of my courses I don't have every single lecture as a video lecture but I do have something multimedia that's supporting every single lecture so it may be a little bit of my voice on a um, PowerPoint or it may be a Vokey or it may be a voice thread which I didn't demonstrate tonight I'm not sure if you www.voicethread.com but things like that where I can post images and a short clip of my voice that introduces part of the lesson where then I ask them to go to, to their textbook. Something I don't use and I get asked often, I really don't use the textbook uh, kits and packages that come online. I, I usually don't, uh, don't use them and I don't think any of my colleagues are using them either. Um, they, they have you know, uh, great resources but they're expensive for students and you can do so much more with, with so much less uh, in your online course in your own development. Did I answer your question? Yes, and I, I was just wondering because last semester when we transferred online, I had a lot of the lessons being recorded and we learned that way. Whereas this semester, it's a lot more teaching yourself in the book. So I was just wondering what way you do it. Well, the, the teaching, I mean, the book is always in, in, in my course a resource. So it's really hopefully enhancing what you're doing as kind of the, the main, um, the structure of the, of the lesson or of the module. So I use, if I'm giving something out of the book to read or respond to, then I have some other way also to interact with that, whether it's in a discussion board or a screencast, or um, I have them many times using some of the free tools uh, that even like Google Sites um, uh, to create some way to communicate that text-based information because I really don't ever, because that's more document repository, I really don't ever have them reading the book and that's the lesson. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's more I, of a way I, to interact with it. Yeah. yeah I, was, I agree with you. I was just wondering what you do. Yeah. And then as far as K to 12, uh -huh. how do you make sure that your students aren't giving out personal information or either verbally or with their background? So I had a student few days ago actually tell everyone his address over the lesson and we were taken aback by that. Yeah and how long did it take that student to get that out? Were, were you able, did you know, did you not, I guess maybe you didn't know it was coming because we try very hard to have the, the, the one hand shut down if something's getting ready to come out or something personal is getting ready to happen on a screen that we shut it down, down to um, uh, either no audio at all, sometimes no video, but um, if that's getting ready to come out, if, if there's a way to, to stop it, if you've recorded that, 
then legally, I mean, if that was a time that you were recording and it very well might be, you have to destroy it or you have to, to edit it and take it out. So that doesn't become a part of a permanent um, uh, repository somewhere that could be hacked. That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. And again, that's how you're to involve the parents and have the parents have, you know, a parent night, a couple of nights. Parent night can't be more important right now because, you know, like I said, because the environment in the room or sharing anything at all that could identify where they are. And that's a scary one. What was the context for the child sharing? Um, he was talking about how his birthday is coming up and he wanted to invite the teacher to come to his house for a birthday party. Okay. And he said his address so quickly that she wasn't able to mute him. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And, and I guess it, it, it really comes down to constant reminders of, unfortunately, there are people out there that are, and, and the little guys don't even know the word predator, but there are people out there that will try to find out information about you and you don't want anyone to know anything other than your, your, um, your, your um, work in the classroom. And that's it. And so, it, so I don't want to cut you off, Patricia, but we're, we're just at a little over six. So oh, I want to be respectful of people's time. Sure. Uh, everyone, we're, we're going to stay a little longer. And uh, Patricia, as long as you're good with uh, sure. staying on a little longer. But uh, if anyone needs to go, certainly feel free to. Uh, and in the meantime, we've had a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, Ishwar was asking about uh, one challenge in initial foray into online teaching was uh, over Zoom, he was encouraging students to turn on their cameras, but then provided uh, them the opportunity not to if uh, they were not necessarily feeling safe uh -huh. uh, or having a bad hair day. But students now seem very hesitant to keep their cameras on if they're the only ones in the group who are doing so. And uh, do you have a policy or could you speak on how you uh, might maximize camera usage without explicitly requiring it. Yes, uh, we go with, it, depending on the age group, for the younger younger group, we go with um, interval interval video. And it's not really, I mean, it's not the same as the, the, the blended idea that we talked about earlier, but we use inter, interval video. So if, if that's, if, and we can't require, um, I really can't even require it at the, at the graduate level. I can't require someone to give me a video feed. I can require them to be, be present, um, but only if that's uh, in the course description. So with the little kids, we've done a lot of interval video where they're not constantly on, but their audio is on. And a lot of schools, and the schools are so different everywhere. And in North Carolina, it's d different everywhere. Some, the, the child has to be online for a three hour block. That's a lot of video feed and a lot of time to, to be in a, in a, in a block. So we've done it where the whole class is just listening. And then we say, whole class listen, whole class look. Whole class listen, whole class look. And that seems to give, take away a little bit of the stress of I'm seeing my face the entire time and also gives them the opportunity to um, stretch. Like I said, they need to be able to move um, and gives them an opportunity to stress or, stretch or just stop for a moment. And, and that's the hardest part. And that's hard for teachers too. But sometimes the kids just need to stop. And, and that should be okay in this environment. Um, but it's, it's a tough one. Great, thanks. And uh, can you give suggestions about your favorite websites? Oh my, um, <laughs> websites for, actually, you know what I have? And I can, I can have this sent out. I have a, a great link to um, uh, websites for, for, for teachers that we've been, we've been using um, at ECU. I, I, didn't, I didn't think to, to include it here, but I, I can. I can uh, adjust the PowerPoint and, and include that for everyone. That resources that we've been using that help with classroom management and help with um, getting video out there and, and audio. If that's what you mean, the, the resource, the technological resources, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I see some thumbs up, okay. Yeah, um, I'm happy to share that. Um, we've, we've been sharing that with, uh, with teachers in, in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, and I'm pretty sure we have the ability to figure out who all was on here to be able to send back based on the RSVP. So. Yeah, I saw, all the, I saw all the names. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that would be linked to a, an email. I didn't, I didn't have an email, but um, yeah, that, that, would be no, that would be no problem. If, if that's helpful, I'd, I'd be happy to, to share that. Um, Great. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? I think that got everything that was in the, the chat line. I love that. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Yeah. If there's uh, anything else, I'm, I'm happy to stay longer if, if there's something else that I can help with or if you, my uh, email is there and I'm happy to, to still keep the conversation going or send me a note in two weeks or something when, when you think of uh, something that you'd like to know. And this is a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I know that. So it's, it's hard for me to <laughs> take a, everything that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm doing with online learning and break it down into a small talk. But I've really enjoyed it and I enjoy your questions and the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank doctor. Thank you, Dr. Slaughter Van Tryon. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us for our first OWL Hour for the College of Education and Human Development. And again, if you have ideas of other presentations you'd like to hear about, certainly send them to us at alumni.ed at temple.edu. And we will look forward to uh, having our e-newsletter give you more information about upcoming events and presentations. Thanks again for joining us and have a great night.